In this series, we've been milking New York City dry of the fashion industry's most influential and intriguing business-savvy players. This week, for the final installment of our educational staycation, we're rising to the ultimate FOF challenge, delving deep into one of the 21st century's greatest literary inventions, the fashion blog. Hi, guys. In order to do the subject justice, we'll be rattling through a quick potted history of the evolution of the medium, before looking to the future with a woman who's found huge success with the unlikely combination of bar humor <gasps> and high fashion, Leandra Medine of Man Repeller. Thank you so much for watching my show. Don't forget to subscribe to the British Vogue YouTube channel. Thank you very much. I'm Alexa Chung and it is on! <laughs>
authored by journalist in training Leandra Medin, whose self deprecating comedic fashion focused commentary hit a real chord with women all over the US and beyond. So, this is typically what an editorial meeting looks like, Alexa. Thanks. Over a period of six years since the blog was conceived, she's won awards, topped a multitude of power lists, published a book, and has developed Man Repeller into one of the most respected voices in the industry. That's do you have a idea. no idea is a bad idea policy in this room? A no idea is a bad idea? Yeah. No, that we do not have that policy. What we have learned is that many ideas are bad ideas. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, she's got the cream of the crop of young women queuing up for a job in the NoHo office as she forges crunchy, colorful new paths in fashion publishing. So this is a resume that we just received for someone who'd like to intern at Man Repeller this summer. Oh my god, how amazing. So that instead of ingredients, she's got language proficiency, Spanish 100, English 100%, French 50%. How cute. Oh, she calls us Fruit Loops in a world of Cheerios. That's why she chose Fruit Loops. Oh, I'm teary-eyed. I'm literally teary-eyed. What did you study at university? I went to school for journalism, and I started Man Repeller when I was a junior um, to hand in with my resume when I applied for jobs at New York Magazine and The New Yorker, because mm -hmm. those were the two places I wanted to work. But what, what came before Man Repeller? Were there any other blogs out there? I had a blog before Man Repeller. And yeah, go on, tell everyone what it was called. Boogers and Bagels. Real nice. The byline was, just kidding, this has nothing to do with bagels. <laughs> and how did you come up with the name Man repeller, and how bored are you of that question? Well, no, I'm actually not bored of that question because every time, I, every time I'm asked it, I get to answer it, and every time I answer it, it gets a little bit spicier, like I start oh. pep, you know, peppering new details. Lying, in. basically. Not lying. <laughs> I was broken up with my husband at the time, and he wasn't my husband yet. He was just okay. an ex-boyfriend. Right. And I was also dating another guy, and another guy. Yeah. Wait, were you doing that New Yorker thing where you can date multiple people without At having... one time? Well, I thought I was. I felt so cool. I was like riding this high horse and I'm like, look at me, I'm dating three guys <laughs> at once. Each and every one of them is obsessed with me. And then I had this realization that none of them actually liked me because <laughs> I was still single. And it's Saturday night and I'm watching a movie with my mom. Mm -hmm. So that's how you came up with Man Repeller? So I was complaining <laughs> to my friend about this while we were at Topshop, and she was like, why are you so surprised? Look at all the clothing you're about to try on. And I was like, oh. And then we went into the dressing room, and I took off my pants, and she's like, when's the last time you got a bikini wax? <laughs> and I was like, ah. And that's how Man Repeller was born. So do you think you have to have a bikini wax to get a boyfriend? No, but I don't <laughs> think it's unhelpful if you want to have a boyfriend who's going to pleasure you with his mouth. Right. I'm sorry I said that. That's okay. It's probably not going to make the cut. <laughs> it's hard for one to remember and cast your mind back to a moment before Man Repeller existed mm -hmm. and that terminology was bandied around. Did that phrase exist before you made it a thing? No, I, the phrase did not exist, but I think that man repelling, which is essentially dressing for yourself, regardless mm -hmm. of what that means, is a social condition that has, has existed in fashion since its establishment. It gained traction really, really fast. I think partially because I was very active on Twitter, and I think as a result of that, a couple of editors at places like Refinery29 and Fashionista and the New York Daily News yeah. were following me. And so when I started posting links to articles, they would see them and then write about them on their So you were giving them content for free, basically? So basically. And they'd be like, oh, look at this funny new website. It's called Man Repeller. And okay. then Refinery picked it up. And then the New York Daily News reached out. And then six months after I started, the New York Times profiled me. And I was like, that's it. I'm done. It's, <laughs> this is the end of it. Finished. See you later. I can't wait to tell my kids I was in the New York Times in 2012. Um, but then I was wrong. It wasn't done. The number one question people Google a lot is, mm -hmm. how do blogs make money? Mm -hmm. How do blogs make money? I'm just kidding. <laughs> when I started Man Repeller, brands would email me and say either, we'd love to collaborate with you or do you sell advertising? And I was managing it on my own and just mm -hmm. you know pulling it out of my butt. <laughs> I, like Nasty Gal was our first advertiser and they were like, we'd love to run banner ads. And I was like, that will be $2,000, please. <laughs> For that, I don't know how much money that is. is I that was like, good? no. Okay. I was how much is a banner I was ad playing then? business. Most people charge them based on a cost per impression or a cost per click. Okay. They don't just charge flat fees. I see. Okay. You know, like when you're younger and you play bank. No, because no? I I was busy literally sitting in a field drawing my horse. <laughs> okay. While you were playing bank, 
I was like, oh, I wish that Pippi had pink hair. <laughs> So we sold some banner ads or I sold some banner ads, but not really. It was mostly collaborations with other brands. So I did, I made a trench coat with a brand called Griffin. That's no longer in existence, but that was Because of your collaboration? Of Probably. Final nail in the coffin? Mm -hmm. So collaborations, um, appearances. Okay, ready guys? Action. Hi guys, it's me, Leandra. And today we're gonna paint some happy clouds on my face. No, we're not. And everything is so different now with Instagram. So many of the blogs that were around when I started are no longer, they no longer really have a presence on desktop. Because they're just doing Instagram? On Instagram, yeah. How has that become an important part of people's I don't, business? Well, because it's a, that's a lot of influence, right? It's become a new form of media, Instagram. People charge as much as like $10,000 for a post. Mm. And they make that, and then they probably go to Celine and buy necklaces. You don't do those, though? No, we don't do that because our head of monetization really understood Man Repeller right off the bat, right. and that our metric of success was going to be measured in influence and quality versus actual quantity. Mm -hmm. And she has a very, very good sense of what works for us and what doesn't. So I've never actually had to put in place a strategy for her because her taste is just so on point. Were you always this confident or did you gain confidence through your site doing really well? Do you think I'm confident? You're, you're taking a risk, which I think some people are kind of intimidated by the idea of putting themselves out there even. Right. Well, I definitely trust my instinct. I, mm -hmm. I trust my gut and I think I have good ideas. Yeah. Even though sometimes I, they're not good ideas. There's a difference in my mind between an entrepreneur and a smart business person. Mm -hmm. I think that I'm much more entrepreneurial than I am actually business savvy. Okay. You know, so I'm a very innovative thinker and I'm, I'm certainly ahead of what's going to happen right. in terms of media. But I freeze when the operational stuff comes up, uh -huh. when it actually comes time to hire a new developer uh -huh. or look for an operations person. I'm just like, I can't do this. When you're interviewing for new people to join the team, what are you asking them about and how relevant is their degree or something that they've had work experience at uh, in terms of what you're looking for? For the more operational and tedious roles, that work experience is obviously really important. But mostly I like to get a sense of the people, like what do they do on weekends? How do they respond to situations? Like mm -hmm. when we're at Restaurants, are they saying thank you to the waiter or waitress when they're coming by? That's always a pretty good way <laughs> to measure what kind of people they are. Sometimes you just get a really good feeling about someone when you sit down with them. Can you break down what some of the people in this office, for example, are doing? So we have a deputy editor, who's essentially my creative right hand. Then we have a photographer who shoots all of the original content. A managing editor who manages making sure that all of our contributors are hitting their deadlines. Then we have a social media director and a content strategist because, you know, the home page on a website isn't really a home page anymore. Only like 15% of our traffic hits the home page. Most people are coming in sideways. Why? So from, from social media, and, uh, Twitter feed, the Facebook feed. Right. And then we have a sales team and they just work on bringing in the monies. What advice would you give anyone that's trying to start their own media company slash blog? Hmm. So the thing I say beyond be really niche, be streamlined, don't try to be something for everyone, just be everything for someone, is that even beyond actually coming up with your concept, it's really important to remain vulnerable because you're, you're very, very honest with yourself when you're feeling vulnerable and the sort of like self-awareness that comes out of that vulnerability is often very, very helpful in your decision-making process. Mm. So be vulnerable, Remember where your priorities are and keep that in mind. That's lovely. And open your legs. <laughs> yeah. I really found it inspiring to talk to Leandra. I immediately sort of took her advice and started telling my colleagues different ideas for how we could run our business. It's interesting to see how fashion is evolving and I think all these brands are turning into media companies in their own right because they have to. And the shopping experience is far beyond brick and mortar at this point. It's like that might be the flagship and there's justification for having those shops like opening ceremony which has turned into basically a storytelling experience. But that's not the be all and end all of the customer's interaction with your brand. 
Incorporating tech can actually provide your business with even more of a backbone. I think the takeaway thing from talking to all of those people has been that they managed to find the right partners in order to become successful. If you're not very good at the business side or logistics, then you should admit that and find someone that is and vice versa. There's plenty of jobs out there for you and you know they're very much needed. To people watching this, I hope that they're inspired to just explore, I think. I think the thing that we've learned from this series and the last is that there's so many benefits to doing internships in a number of different career options because all of that will feed in one day to just knowing more about your craft. And you know, take someone like Brian Phillips who was working at a magazine and doing editorial and had a huge interest in art and then he's parlayed that into a fantastic business model with Black Frame who provide that wonderful crossover. You know, stop feeling like there's a limited pool of things you can do because if something's oversaturated then why not be entrepreneurial and make up your own thing? You don't have to always follow the crowd and actually the world would benefit from more creative, exciting things. Well, I ran out of steam. I'm tired, leave me alone. We talked to so many people. So now I'm gonna nap and dream of fashion as per usual. And that's it. Another series of the future of fashion draws to an end. I'm off to continue my quest for world domination and bigger sleeves. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for recommending this to your friends. Thank you. And as ever, subscribe to the British Vogue YouTube channel, where I will see you soon. Bye. Put your comments in the box. I'm going to go down the stairs now. <laughs>